God and friend. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do. Thank you, Lord, God, who is heaven, mighty in heaven and on earth. That spoke a word and there was light. They say in John 1 that there was more light. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen him. What a privilege this is. And God, you've let us, some of us get to know him and call him friend. God, what a privilege, what an honor. I pray that you help us see Jesus as a friend, as a king, as the lover of our souls, the one worth all glory and all adoration and all praise, now and forevermore. It says in your word that all knees will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. God, help us see that. God, we long to see that. God, we're thirsty, we're hungry to see that. Nothing compares to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> My name is Carrie. Uh, you guys got to see my wife come up here. Her name is Erin. We have two children. Uh, my son is three. His name is Micah. And then we have an almost two-year-old. Her name is Keziah. Keep us busy. <laughs> so we're here today for Easter. Some of y'all are here today because it's launch Sunday. Because this is the first day of Pillar Norfolk being opened. But you really got to RSVP for something bigger and better than all that. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Jesus is giving us a front row seat today to enjoy his resurrection. Now. Here's the thing. Some of y'all came here just because maybe you got an invite from a friend or a family member. Or maybe you heard there's a community meal tonight. Maybe you came for that. That's great. But I want to make it clear. You have a front row seat today to hear from the Lord Jesus about his resurrection. And here's the thing. It's not happenstance. This isn't. Uh, a, a chance thing that you're here in this room. This isn't, uh, you know, it's because my, my family member dragged me here. That's why I'm here in this room. This is a Jesus ushered you to this room kind of a thing. Jesus wants you to hear about him. And he wants to make it definitively clear how awesome, how perfect, how powerful he is. And so that's what we are going to do today. See, the tomb is empty so that the church would be full yes. with hot hearts for Jesus. That's where he's going. That's where he's taking us. So Luke 24, 
verse 13 to 35. You can stand with me. Um, we'll read God's word together. Luke 24, verse 13 to 35. I'm going to be reading it in the English Standard Version. Luke 24, 13 to 35. It says that very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that, they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interrupted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, excuse me, interpreted. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. You may be seated. So in this story, it's two disciples who are completely devastated. See, three days earlier, they were in Jerusalem and they, they watched Jesus, who they describe as a, a good prophet before man and before people. They watched Jesus be blamed, be brutally beaten, be put on trial, though innocent. And then they watched him be placed on a cross to die. They're completely confused. This makes no sense. Because Jesus, he had been doing all these good things. How did it end so bad? He fed 5,000. He's, he's healing people of diseases. He's, he's spending time with the lowly people. So why does the story end like this? This is, this is devastating. They don't know what to do. So they're at Jerusalem. And here's the thing. All they heard was, they're, they're like, hey, we heard some women. They, they went to his tomb in the morning, and they were actually, they were just going to um, embalm his body. But they said he wasn't there. And they, but they said they saw some angels 
saying that he's alive. So they're devastated, they're confused, and so they're walking on their way home. And who comes to join them? Jesus. And they don't know it's Jesus. He doesn't make himself recognizable to them just yet, but he walks with them. And Jesus engages them by his spirit. See, the text says, here's how the... the, the these disciples as they're walking, here's how they see the picture. It says, while they were talking and discussing together, this is how they see it. They say, their chief priests and rulers delivered Jesus to be condemned to death and crucified. But Jesus draws near by his spirit. I've had Jesus draw near to me by his spirit a couple times, but it's impossible to forget the first one it's impossible to forget the first one i remember I, I i went to church a lot as a kid and i i equated going to church a lot the same as having a relationship with god I thought it was pretty much the same thing but by 17 he started knocking on the door in my heart making it crystal clear that i did not have a genuine relationship with him so I'm tussling, though, with it in high school because it's like, man, I want to fit in, right? But at the same time, I want a general relationship with him, too. Well, we all know it doesn't work like that, right? It don't work like that. So I'm in youth group, and I hear my youth pastor talking about Jesus and how you need to submit to him, submit to his lordship. And I'm just like, man, I'm kinda, I kind of work my ranks up in the youth group, right? I'm getting kind of cool. I'm doing some leadership stuff. So if I, if I say that I don't have a genuine relationship, where's that going to put me at on the social status rate? So I don't say nothing. 17, fast forward to 20, I get to a Christian school. I hear talk about Jesus again. And this time, three years of, of this contemplating uncertainty, I'm like, man, I'm tired. Like I told you, I went to church a lot as a kid. I've heard about him. I heard how he rose from the grave and how he's alive and how he wants genuine relationship with me. But I'm tired of fighting. So 20 years old, I give my life to Christ. Because why? Not because of me. This story isn't me following Jesus. This story is in Jesus engaging me by his spirit. Now here's the thing. Jesus is still alive and well today. And some of y'all have already been engaged by his spirit and you are having a rich relationship with him. But guess what? The reason why Jesus has us here in this room is because he wants to continue engaging us by his relationship. Some of y'all might not know Jesus in that genuine, intimate relationship kind of way. But guess what? He wants to make himself known to you. That's what he's showing us from this text. That's why he walks an hour and a half with people that are completely broken. And he'll do that today still. He will walk with you and he will talk with you because Jesus engages us by his spirit. And I know some of y'all might be listening to me, hearing me say that. You're like, Jesus, Carrie, I don't know. That, don't, that, don't, that sounds off. I actually, I actually like my lifestyle the way it is. I actually like the route I'm going. I like how I'm going up the social status ranks, but here's the thing. I like you know the same. There's that, there's that little burning inside your heart that says, you know what, it's off trying to go that other way, but I think I'll go a little longer. Well, here's what I'm telling you. Jesus is engaging you by his spirit. Submit. Yeah. He is a good and faithful friend. He don't let you down. He does not let you down. So Jesus, he comes, he engages us by his spirit like he did with the disciples. Then he enlightens us by his word. Right? See, the, the two disciples... They're walking, right? And they're like, man, you know, here's what we thought of Jesus. They tell us. They tell us in the text what they thought of Jesus. They say Jesus is of Nazareth. They don't say Jesus is from heaven. 
Jesus is of Nazareth, and they say he's a prophet who is mighty indeed before God and before people. Jesus is a prophet, yes. A prophet tells you of the future, but Jesus is more than a prophet. But then they say Jesus, he, he was our hope. He was supposed to be the redeemer of Israel, right? So they're looking for like a political figure who's going to come in, right? And he's going he's gonna to galvanize some people. They're going to take over Rome at the time. And then from Rome, they're going to take over the rest of the world. That's what they're looking for. Jesus could do that. And he, he'll, he'll do that. But he's much more than a political figure. He's looking for much more than that. And the thing is, the only way to see who Jesus truly is, is to be enlightened by his word. We have to be enlightened by his word. And he tells us who he is. In the, he says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus is saying, hey, yeah, y'all, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a prophet. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take over the world. The world is mine, everything in it. But what y'all need to know is I actually came first to suffer. So he takes them, he, he, starts, he starts taking them through this master class. As they're walking this road, they don't know it's Jesus. He's taking them to this master class. He starts back in Genesis 3, and he's, Genesis 3.15 says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between you, your offspring, and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That's God talking to Satan, telling Satan, hey, you will try to go after my offspring, which is Jesus, but Jesus will prevail. But it gives us, it gives us a foreshadowing. There's going to be some sort of suffering playing out. Then you go to Exodus. So picture this. This is a part of history where Israel, they're slaves to Egypt, right? And so uh, God does a series of plagues to let Egypt know, hey, y'all need to release my people. So there was political slavery going on back then for the Israelites too. Well, well they go, plague one, plague two, plague three, plague four. Well, by the time we get to the 10th plague, God says, hey, all the firstborn in Egypt will die. Because God is making it that crystal clear, I'm going to release my people. The only way to avoid having your firstborn die is you got to take a lamb, a perfect lamb with no blemish. And you got to kill the lamb. And you got to take the blood of that lamb. And you got to put it on your doorpost. And when I see that blood, I will pass over your house. That's a foreshadow. Some God is showing us there's going to be some suffering for some people to be set free. You go to Isaiah 53. We hear more of this suffering. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows. With deepest grief, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God. A punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Jesus is walking with these people telling them, listen, you know that lamb? That has to be killed and that blood is, is put over the doorhouse so that you, your house will be saved. I'm that lamb. Yeah. You know that story where Abraham has to take his only son up to a mountain and, and kill his son? You remember that story? 
Well, you know how God provides a, a ram last minute so that Abraham doesn't have to kill his son? Jesus is saying, that ram is me. Wow. He's saying, that's me over and over and over to make it crystal clear. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, Jesus became sin, though he knew no sin, so that we might become his righteousness. Amen. So Jesus is giving them a master class to say, hey, listen, you don't let me enlighten you on this word right quick. Yes, I am a prophet. You got that right. Yes, I am a political leader. I run the world. That's what it says in Psalm 24. He says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But he says, I do more than that. He says, I restore your soul. He says, I restore your soul. So here, here's what Jesus is. Here's, let me put it a different way. Here's what Jesus is saying. You two people walking down this road, you think you're right before God because you were born in Israelite. You think your lineage makes you right with God. Is there anybody in the room like that? You think your lineage makes you right with God? You think grandmother's prayers is enough to make you right with God? Jesus is saying that's not enough. But then we, let, let's go to the knowledge side. Man, I, I, I know some things about Jesus. Kind of like I told y'all. I told y'all I grew up in church. You know what I'm saying? I, I went to Sunday school. I, I didn't want to. Hey, praise the Lord. That ain't enough neither. Jesus said, look, it works one way. You need one Savior. And he came, he lived a perfect life, like that lamb we talked about, so that he could be a sacrifice for your sin, for my sin. What kind of sin are we talking about? We talking about that thief kind of sin. We talking about that lying kind of sin. We talking about that coveting kind of sin. You know when you want something that's, that doesn't belong to you, and in your heart you know it, but nobody else does. You know how like you think that's just in and out of your mind, but no one else is counting it. God does. God does. He, he counts all of that. And then in Psalm forty, I love how it says this. It says, "It says my sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out." God is keeping track of these sins. Just track, track, track. And listen, the only one that can eliminate all that sin standing before God when you meet him is Jesus. Yes. That's what he's enlightening him on the word about. He's saying, listen, I'm the one that makes men right with God. He's the Psalm 24. Psalm 24, we would just read it. It says, uh, who can go up to the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? No one. Amen. No, not one. But Jesus. And Jesus is saying, listen. Hey, listen. I can take you up there. I got you. Oh, man. He's enlightening him on the word, y'all. He's enlightening him on the word. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing about enlightening on God's word. Because we're going to touch on it a little bit at the end. But like. So if you, 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 you see how the story is, these, these disciples, they go from completely discouraged to completely inspired. They were walking on their way home, but then they actually turn around in, in darkness and they go back to Jerusalem. They're like, yo, we got to tell people Jesus was just walking with us. Well, then they go and they tell them, they're like, yo, Jesus was just, just walking with us. He was talking with us. This, this is dope. It's crazy, man. We're so excited. We're so excited. And then next, you know, Jesus appears in the room. And they're scared. They're scared. They think, they, they think Jesus is a ghost. They're like, this is, this is crazy. Well, Jesus said, listen, how about somebody give me some bread? I'm not a ghost. Somebody give me some bread to eat. You know, let's sit. Let's talk a little bit. So Jesus is talking with them. And now they're all just shouting, praising God. But they don't know what to do next. Right? It's just like, this is exciting. This is, oh my, this is, you know. Well, 50 days later, there's what's called Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So God goes from just getting some disciples exciting to then getting some people saved. Well, you read the book of Acts, and that's where you see the first church pop up. So as God enlightens us in his word, guess what he's doing? He's getting our hearts hot. He's getting people saved. So guess what? He can start a church. Ta-da! That's what we're doing here. <laughs> God 
is getting hearts hot so that people will be saved and that people will be sanctified. And then he's starting a church. What is the church going to do? The church is going to go tell more people. And then that's how you get a new church and a new church and a new church and a new church. And that's what we want to do here at Pillar North Church. Pillar North Church. We're coming from Pillar Dumfries. That's our mommy church. That's our sending church. Pillar Dumfries was started 18 years ago. Within 18 years, they birthed either a daughter or, or granddaughter over 30 churches. Wow. That's where we're coming from. And that's, that's, not a, that's not a them thing. That's a Bible thing. You see what I'm saying? That's a Bible thing. And so we just want to reproduce that. We want to see that reproduced here. Amen. Why? Because here's my pitch for Norfolk. You see, you got, you got Norfolk, right? There are over 650 churches in Norfolk. That's most. There's the most churches are in this city out of all the cities in the U.S. Now, the, Norfolk is part of six other cities, which is called Hampton Roads. Portsmouth, Chesapeake, right? Um, Virginia Beach. Well, all those cities right there is called Hampton Roads. They say it's estimated one out of four of them is connected to the military. Well, then you, you flip the question around, out of all those 650 churches, who is trying to reach the military? Who's like intentionally trying to reach the military, like care on military marriages? Try to reach uh, these, these young sailors and, and these seamen to help them know Jesus. Because it's really hard with them. Why? Because they're only here so long. And, and unfortunately, in some cases, they can get treated a little less than just because of how long they're here. Well, those people need to know Jesus too, right? Yeah. And so this church is dedicated to doing that. And we want to see other churches started to help dedicate it to do that. Amen. Right? And that's all just by being enlightened by God's word. Right? All people matter. Amen. All people matter. Why? Because they're made in God's image. And, and as long as he gives us breath, we want to reach people, especially military people. Raise your hand if you're military here. Or former military. That, that, that'll even help. Mm. Look at all that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, Jesus inspires us to take action. As you see in the story, these two disciples... They're walking. Jesus enlightens them on the word. All of a sudden, because of them being enlightened on the word, they were about to go home for the evening but and turn it in. You know? But they're like, nah, we got to turn on back. And we need to move forward with the mission. So Jesus has inspired them in that way. Just like Jesus inspired me to call Jonathan. Amen. Say, hey, I know we haven't met before back in October 22, <laughs> but uh, this is a small ass, man, but would you be interested in uh, starting a church? <laughs> that's, that's, but that's, that's the kind of inspiration Jesus gives. That's the kind of inspiration he gives. But then guess, here's what's beautiful, right? Because that's one vantage point of the picture. Then you turn it to the other point of view, come to find out, Jonathan's been here 20 years. Wow. And he's in the military. Wow. And he's been dedicating his life to sharing Christ to people in the military. Yeah. I, I couldn't put that story together like that if I tried. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, and then we start meeting other people who are like, man, I care about the military. I care about reaching people. I want to love people no matter how long they will be in or out of the city. And so next thing you know, the Lord's just putting us together. The Lord is inspiring. The Lord is inspiring. The Lord is inspiring. So here's the thing. Like I said earlier, Jesus engages us with his spirit. I know he's doing that right now. He touched us with his word. He enlightened us with his word. And now Jesus is inspiring us to action. 
for some of y'all, Jesus is inspiring you to actually stay here and help this local church. We need help with kids a lot. Um, <laughs> we need help with uh, so many other things that like you, you would see in an, a, another church setting and it, it, it feels normal. But we're, we're like we're the equivalent of a baby. So we need a lot of hands to help out. So maybe Jesus is inspiring you to say, you know what? That crazy guy with that bald head, I think I'll stick around, <laughs> you know? And if, if Jesus is inspiring you to do that, we gladly welcome you to do that with us. Jesus might be inspiring you, though, to say, you know what? I've been walking on that road of Emmaus, and I, I've, I haven't been right with him, but, but you know, he does work, and I, I, I hear what Carrie's saying. I can't describe it. It's kind of like a little tingling where it's like, like the spiritual and, and the physical collide where it's like, man, I, I'm trying to make my, my physical side fight my spiritual side. But yeah, maybe that is Jesus that is telling me he's engaging me to say, I want to be with you. Well, today's a good day for that. Amen. Today is a great day for that. Yes. Maybe um, Jesus is engaging you just to simply give toward the ministry. Maybe Jesus is inspiring you to, to be a part of another ministry. Either way, Jesus wants to build his kingdom, and the building blocks are us sitting here in this room. That's what he wants to do. Why? Because the tomb is empty, so the church can be full with heart to be hot hearts. Yes. Yes. So I just want to take a moment now and acknowledge the fact that God is working. Amen. So if everyone could close your eyes, bow your heads, please. I know that God is working here. And if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, that's okay. You're no different than anyone else. There was a point in time maybe in your life that, that you were really far from him, but Jesus is so gentle and kind that he, he's drawing you close. He says, submit to his lordship. Submit to the sweetness of his lordship. Say, Lord, there's, there's these sins that I have, these things that I've done that I regret, but I find myself doing again. And God, I'm tired of them. I want to follow your way. God, I don't even know how to follow your way, but I want to follow your way. If that's you, as, as, as heads are bowed, as eyes are closed, if that's you, take a moment and, and you can just raise your hand, no one, no one else looking. But you can just raise your hand and say, I'm tired of, of fighting and trying to do things my own way, trying to mesh the spiritual world and the physical world. I just want to follow Jesus. I just want to follow Jesus. Like the first song says, what a friend we have in Jesus. Give a moment. Yes. Yes. You can put your hands down, please. And you can pray with me this prayer, and then we, we got to talk after service. Lord God, I am tired of trying to save myself. It's meaningless. It is not worth my time. Lord, I want to follow you as you are Lord. You have risen from the dead. You are worth following. Thank you that, Lord, today you call me into relationship with you. Lord, help me to experience your sweetness and your beauty. 
more and more each day. Amen.